particularly careful of influences that could compromise their independence. The problem is aggravated by the entrenched political racial divide that has endured since the colonial era. Now, in 2020, for me, the main problem is that the present administration has not engendered trust from the population. The word is trust. Now, in assessing this cabinet, I have already written that, and I quote, without a high purpose, a central motivating force, emptiness pervades life and work, deterioration then sets in. The fundamental problem with this administration is that there is no central compelling vision, no center, no reference point. The effect has been a disturbing absence of scruples on their part. I'll give you an example. An express investigation, newspaper investigation, into a police probe revealed that a leading minister went to First Citizens Bank with $143,800 in cash. Some of the money was used to meet credit card and mortgage obligation, whilst $93,000 was deposited in her savings. Now, this deposit was $90,000. Uh, there was a threshold for it, and it required the depositor to fill out a, a legally binding source, source of funds declaration in which he stated that the cash was from a bank account at Republic Bank. And this proved to be false. Because according to the police investigation, the, the minister did not withdraw $143,800 from the Republic Bank. So where did the money come from? The Express said that the minister's financial affairs are a matter of valid public interest, given the interplay between political financing and government influence. But the Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, was brutally dismissive of all query. He descri describing one persistent inquirer as a self-promoting nuisance and a damn hypocrite. I asked, is this democracy or autocracy? And the thing is, the entire cabinet seemed to have digest digested this implausible claim that the minister had withdrawn this huge amount of cash from one bank, possibly stuck the money into a handbag, and walked into another bank to conduct transactions instead of using a manager's check or wire transfer. The attorney general of all people, who is the defender of law and the constitution, he claimed to be satisfied with the transaction and that he actually saw a Republic Bank letter, which the AG claims exonerates his colleague. But when pressed to have this Republic Bank letter revealed, um, he demurred. This is the same attorney general who, using Legislation by stealth, as has been described by two other commentators, attempted to surreptitiously amend the Freedom of Information Act. So the question we must ask ourselves tonight is, with this level of amorality, amorality, can we trust this administration not to interfere with the electoral process and surreptitiously distort it in some way? Can we be comfortable with the absence of observer missions to our election election? Now, there will be there will be been some comfort in the case that I quoted is an isolated one, but the rot abounds in this administration. For example, the cabinet took a decision to rent a property owned by the attorney general and his wife, which will earn them over $23 million in three years without full disclosure by the AG. In fact, the cabinet note of February 12, 2019 listed, did not list the shareholders of the property. And apparently also in another instance, with the approval of the Attorney General and the National Security Minister and possibly the Prime Minister, $150,000 of public funds was used as hush money to protect a former minister in a sexual harassment case brought by, brought by, his, by his personal secretary. The prime, we have also had crookedness of procurement for vessels on the sea bridge. A cabinet minister now before the courts on corruption charges. And another cabinet minister reportedly ordered by the New York Supreme Court to pay back over US $100,000 to a senior citizen and return the deed to the citizens' multi-million dollar condo. 
So it, 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 it clearly, there, there is clearly a level of unscrupulousness, unacceptable unscrupulousness in this cabinet. And I am asking, can such an environment in our cabinet engender violation of the electoral process by the administration in Trinidad and Tobago? We've also had the Petrotrin Sin closing down the refinery and so on. So, you know, this administration under a, is under a large, a, a dark cloud of suspicion. And in my view, the leader is largely responsible. Now, we all know that Peter Drucker describes leadership as lifting a person's vision to high sight, the raising of a person's performance to a higher standard, the building of a personality beyond its limitations, its normal limitations. But Dr. Keith Rowley has really not done this for his cabinet. In, in my view, he has been far from exemplary or inspiring. And indeed, grave doubts have arisen about his own truthfulness. For example, we still don't know the reason for that sudden visit by Delcy Rodriguez, Venezuelan vice president, in the midst of the pandemic, accompanied by high energy officials. But we do know that the next day, Paria, our energy purchasing company, activated a shipment of fuel that reached Venezuela, possibly violating US sanctions. Also, the Chief Justice did not deny yet recommended to the Prime Minister the names of three people to obtain HTC housing, but Rowley took some time before denying the communication between himself and Chief Justice Ivor Archie on the issue. So which of these two high office, highest office of of office holders was being dishonest. And what is the truth behind the cabinet note brought by Rowley as housing, housing minister in 2018 18, containing lavish terms and conditions with unprecedented benefits for the Chinese uh, company CGGC, which was once blacklisted for misconduct by the World Bank. You know, there are several other issues that brings into question the prime minister's truthfulness. And I make the point tonight that the lack of trust in its leader is the greatest generator of doubt about the integrity of the electoral process in any country. Therefore, it would have been reassuring if observer missions were here. We are told by the Prime Minister himself that he received a letter from the Commonwealth stating that he cannot afford to send a mission under our, our quarantine arrangement. But when he was asked to show the nation the letter, Rowley retorted, I am showing nobody any letter. I am telling you the people, and I know you will accept that from a prime minister who always tells you the truth. When he said that, and his approach to this thing, the, e the uneasiness increased among a great many people as we approach holding you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, panel. Thank you, Kumar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Maraj, and um, goodbye. It's a pity you can't stay on um, with us for the entire meeting, but we wish you uh, a good night. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Indira Rampasad. We have our slight changes because um, Mr. Maraj has to leave early, and there's a, a, a small change later on. Um, so our second speaker is Dr. Indira Rampasad, who is a lecturer at UWE, St. Augustine, Trinidad, in political science and international relations. She speaks a fluent Spanish, and she was an election observer for the Organization of American States, OS, in Grenada, in Salvador, and Guyana. Dr. Rampasad, the floor is yours for seven minutes. Thank you, Dr. Mahabir. I'm uh, just making sure everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so uh, yes, I have been an election observer, as you mentioned, on three occasions, uh, 2007, 2009, 2011. Uh, the last one is in Guyana. And that experience itself uh, taught me how important election observers are. So I was quite disappointed when I heard that we were not going to have election observers in Trinidad and Tobago this year, because we had them in 2015, we had them in 2010, we had them in 2007, 2001, 2000, as far as I can remember, uh, we've had election observers. So it's a, it's a very uncomfortable feeling for me, who have been an observer and understand what they do. See, election observers, we are usually independent parties. 
they're usually international. They come from non-governmental organizations. Uh, they monitor the conduct of the election uh, on the basis of the national legislation and the international election standards. Uh, some people may, may not understand, well, why is the opposition not calling the observers? It's because they have to come on the invitation of the government of the day. It must be on the invitation of the government of the day. So their primary role is to provide an impartial and accurate assessment of the nature of the electoral processes for the benefit of the population of the country where the election is held. We have had in Trinidad and Tobago, we have had observer missions from the Commonwealth, from the OAS, Organization of American States, and from CARICOM. Now, the, the elect, uh, observers don't directly prevent ele electoral fraud. We can't do that. That's, that's not the, that's not the uh, mission of the observers, but rather to record and report We have a, a little uh, internet co connectivity problem, I think. Um, hopefully it's going to stabilize. Hello, Indira, are you hearing us? Okay, so. Okay, then we would have to go on to uh, Professor Kojo until she. Yeah, oh, okay, right. Yeah, sorry. I'm yeah, back. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah, I got. Yeah, it's the inclement weather, I think. Yes, anyway, yes, what I was sorry. saying, it's not, it's not just a one day pro a process. Um, so, what we have is a mission. A mission will go. Uh, the OAS will set up a mission. CARICOM will set up a mission. The Commonwealth will set up a mission in these parts. And it would be headed by a notable individual of some rep repute, uh, good repute. So we've had the Jimmy Carter heading a um, mission from the Carter Center. Or we would have, um, as, we, as we had recently, uh, Owen Arthur from Barbados. Um, and, or you may even have the chair of CARICOM or the head of the Commonwealth. Um, Dr. Rowley called for ambassadors to be observers. He said ambassadors can be observers, but you can't just do that. While you can have internal observers, you can't just call on ambassadors just like that. Amb ambassadors are here on a mission. They represent the particular country. They have to get the permission of their, of their country, whoever they serve, their head of state. In order to do something like that, they have to be trained and they have to be organized in order to do that. And they're usually reluctant to get involved in local politics, which they are not supposed to do. So it would be hardly likely that you could just call on ambassadors overnight and expect them to want to come on and be uh, electoral observers. So they have an international election observer is expected to sign an agreement to a code of conduct. You have to behave yourself in a certain way, respect the, the sovereignty and, the, and international human rights. You have to respect the laws of the country in which you're operating. You have to respect the integrity of the international election, election observer mission. You have to maintain strict political impartiality. You must not obstruct the election process. You must provide appropriate identification. You must maintain accuracy of observations and professionalism in drawing conclusions. You must refrain from making comments to the public or the media before the mission speaks. You must co cooperate with the other election observers from other teams. You must maintain proper personal behavior, behavior. And you're not expected to violate this code of conduct and you have to pledge to follow this code of conduct by, by a signature. So uh, that is basically the role and function of election observers. So it's a serious matter and they don't select any and anyone to do this. They do a total background check on you before you, before you are selected to do this. You can apply, but like I said, this back, background check will be done. Uh, in the 2007 and 2010 elections, we had observers from the Commonwealth and CARICOM at the invitation of then Prime Minister uh, Patrick Manning. And in the 2015 election, we had observers from the Commonwealth at the request of uh, Prime Minister Kamala Prasad Bisesa. So, in my observation of the elections, um, I was particularly struck by Guyana, uh, which is a far cry from what happened this year. In 2011, um, the uh, Barat Jagde government was in power and, it, and he couldn't go back. So it was Donna Ramuta heading for the presidency. And I wrote in the newspaper because I tend to write about my experience and I was allowed to do so after the 
the event. I had to clear it with the head of the mission, of course. And this is what I had said, just to compare with what happened this year. I said I had the privilege of witnessing the elections firsthand as an official international observer of the mission of the Organization of American States. The actual voting on Monday reflected a high level of organization and a well-oiled electoral machinery. Undoubtedly, Guyana's democracy has advanced considerably as election staff, party representatives, and voters alike express deep faith in the electoral process. But we saw something else happening this year. This was not the same report coming out of the March 2020 elections. The National Observer Missions from the Commonwealth, the European Union, the Carter Center, they issued the following statement about Guyana. The national, international election observation missions in Guyana are deeply concerned about the continued lack of transparency in the ascertainment of results for Region 4. So this is going to bring me to your question, um, are observers necessary? And what is the impact of the absence of observers in Trinidad and Tobago in this election? So I would say categorically, yes, uh, they are absolutely necessary. And the recent nightmare in Guyana experience is just one reason why. Observers are necessary when there is mistrust in the electoral process. And I think uh, my friend, um, uh, Mr. Ralph uh, Mirage, just went through that in detail, that there is a high level of mistrust and why there should be a level of mistrust. And when the mistrust extends to the body in charge, of the election process, which is supposed to be independent. In this case, uh, in Guyana, it was the GCOM in Trinidad and Tobago, is the e Election and Boundaries Commission in Trinidad. Then the level, uh, the, the suspicion tends to intensify and exacerbate. So I'm not saying that the Election and Boundaries Commission should not be mistrusted. I said if the process is mistrusted, the commission by extension will automatically be mistrusted by segments of the population. So we have other reasons why in Trinidad and Tobago uh, there would be need for election observers and why there is mistrust. These include the historical experience we have had, the vexing issue of campaign financing and domination of the media, you know, the, 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 the uh, proclivity for power outages during the election counts when the votes are being counted, and the extension of time for voting, which occurred in the last election, 2015, by one hour. And we also have this issue of special vote, the special voting process. So just to tell you a little bit about each of this, um, if the time will permit, um, just going back to 1961, the, the, uh, the, the, the DLP were very upset. They were the opposition, and they saw the attempt by the PNM to institute the permanent registration of voters identification cards, voting machines, and revised electoral boundaries as a strategy to disenfranchise rural Indo voters through intimidation. The DLP had claimed that the Indo Trinidadians will be less likely to register and might be intimidated by complicated vote voting machines. And the DLP had alleged since then that the PNM hoped to rig the elections by allowing Afro-Caribbean immigrants from other islands to vote, as well as to gerrymander the boundaries to ensure PNM victory. And proof of these allegations actually surfaced when A.N.R. Robinson, and we know who he was, former pre president, former prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago, he was declared winner of the Tobago seat with more votes being cast than, were actu than actually existed registered voters. In response to the allegations of these voting irreg irregularities, the DLP boycotted the opening of parliament and operated largely, largely through boycotts and walkouts. In 1971, in that election, Robinson had declared that he would not contest the election. He called upon the DLP to support, which they did, and they launched a no-vote campaign. Many people in the party felt betrayed by Robinson's actions, but the boycott resulted in a switch from voting machines to paper ballots, which we have today. Now, to talk a little bit about cam campaign financing, this is an issue which neither the EBC nor the ruling political parties address in 2007. It was recommended by the CARICOM Observer Mission that year. The EBC head, Dr. Masson, had stated in 2010 that the EBC had not addressed the issue. And this is a major issue because ruling parties in particular, they tend to have enormous resources for campaign financing. We evidenced this in the local government 2019 elections here in December, last December. And where you see in these massive advertisements and you know how much they cost. So for some reason, the ruling party tend to have a lot of money to do this. I don't know where the money comes from. And that is why 
there is need for campaign finance and reforms in Trinidad. They tend to dominate the mainstream media. This week, for example, we saw the uh, PNM running the same campaigns in two channels, the two major channels, TV6 and CNC3, at, at the same time. Right now, to what extent that that's going to help win an election, I'm not sure because we saw that in the local elections, it, uh, it didn't impact. And I'm not sure how, to what extent it will impact in the uh, August 10 general elections. We also saw this morning the, um, the Minister of National Security calling a press conference, uh, calling these people out on a Sunday morning. I'm talking of members of the media. And then lo and behold, everybody think it's something to do with COVID. The media actually uh, started to ask questions about COVID in the end because they couldn't believe this is a personal issue. The minister had a personal issue and the state resources were being used to call a press conference on a Sunday morning and social media is now rife with that, uh, that discussion and whether the, the Minister of National Security should have been doing that because everybody thought, you know, they're going to cancel the election or something to do with COVID and then lo and behold, going to sue the Express and Anna Ramdas. Um, I was totally taken aback by that. Okay, so, can you wrap up, wrap up please? Yeah, so yeah. I just want to say that there were power outages during the count and tallying of the votes in 2007 and 2015. And, there was, and we know about the extension of time by one hour. The, the mistrust, you see, continues because this rather curious judgment of the judge that the, the, what the EBC did there was illegal. But at the same time, you know, the, um, the, 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 the EBC was not penalized for, for that illegality. Um, the special voting... Uh, we have special voting from August 3rd to 9th this year. Um, so the political parties and the citizens of the country, they need to be very vigilant because one, um, one election observer team had an issue with the mixing of the votes, which is allowed. You're allowed to mix the votes, but the persons who were, were involved in it, the presiding officers, didn't seem to be quite trained. So they were concerned about that. And I, that came up in one of the uh, observer reports. So just to close, I would just like to say citizens, um, citizens of Trinidad and Tobago, citizens around the world, in the region, need, we need to be extremely vigilant. There is a level of mistrust in the electoral process and our democracy, this was mentioned both by the Archbishop and the President of the Republic tonight, uh, that our democracy is very fragile. So we want to keep that in mind as we go into election 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rampasad. Um, our second to last speaker is Dr. Selwyn Koju, a professor of Africana Studies at Wellesley College in Massachusetts in the USA. His most recent book is entitled The Slave Master of Trinidad, Williams Hardin Burnley and the 19th Century Atlantic World. Dr. Koju is an academic and African activist much like David Hines in Guyana. Dr. Kojo shocked Trinidad and Tobago this morning when his column appeared in today's Express, pledging support for the opposition UNC party led by Kamala Prasad Bisesa. Over to you, Professor, to speak for seven minutes. Uh, uh, thank you, Kumar, and, uh, for having me, and thanks uh, the other members of the... Uh, thank you for inviting me to this round table discussion. It's good to be here with you guys this evening. It's unfortunate that there will be no foreign observers at the August 10th elections, but I do not share the view. Are you hearing me? Yes, yes, we are hearing. Oh, okay. I, I said it's, uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate that there will not be foreign observers on August 10th elections, but I do not share the view that the elections would not be conducted in a free and fair manner because of their absence. On a topic such as this, I believe that one's political connections and or ethnic fears come into play. I suspect that if you're a member of the UNC, you're likely to take the position that the EBC, known for carrying out free and fair elections, will not act in a fair manner. If you're a member of the PNM, you are likely to say that the EBC has always carried out fair elections and there is no reason to feel that in the absence of the observers, that things would be different. So I think it has a lot to do with where one is coming from, one's political persuasions, one's ethnic origins, and how one feels about the elections. I don't accept the notion that was echoed before by the distrust. I don't happen to think that that is true. Is that another consideration? 
as part of our political maturity, we do not really need observers here. Elections are held in the United States where voter suppression and other forms of voter for forms frauds are present, particularly as it concerns black people. Felons who have served their time are not allowed to vote. Hard to get registration forms and votes are called for and many obstacle, other obstacles are placed in the way of black and brown voters. I don't know that there are election observers in the United States for the elections. I'm not too sure there are. No, am I sure that there are elections in terms of England? Are there people there from England or France that are the election observers? It's quite a hold over from a, a lot of internal distrust for one another and even our own systems. Uh, President Obama, for example, in his eulogy on at the death of Congressman Lewis, highlights the difficulty that even an advanced democracy such as the United States faces in terms of elections. Even more frightening is President Trump's signal that he's not prepared to accept the results of the election if he loses. I do not know if one considers the election results in the UK and, and, and France, whether the new election observers are in fact to be accepted. Yet they proclaim the elections to be fair and free. Why can't we do the same thing here? I have not heard much fears. I haven't heard what, uh, there have been some fears, I think, by some of our leaders. But I think it comes from a place of a lot, a lot of distrust. Sometimes I think I hear the same fears of distrust of one another that goes back to the point when our leaders went to London even to seek independence. There's a historical mistrust. And while I think that it's important to have uh, observers and it would be a great thing to have them. I don't think the absence of observers necessarily means that the elections will be free and fair. And so therefore, I think our, uh, the conduct of elections by the EBC in the absence of foreign observers should be taken as a sign of a maturing democracy. Let's accept the fact that we could be mature. We do not need all these folks to look over us. We did it during independence. We had to send people up to see what's going on and we couldn't trust this government and couldn't trust that one. But it seems to me, we have to be a people who have faith in one another, a people who are ready to conduct their own affairs. I have faith in the EBC and the election watches at the, every polling station where each and every party has their watches to see what's going on. And I think more importantly, we should welcome the challenge of not having observers and seek to have more faith in ourselves. When we have, have some of these discussions, all we do is re-reiterate re, uh, our fears rather than speak to our hopes that we as a country cannot carry on our fair elections unless there's some foreign observer, some foreign person, some colonial enterprise out there to ensure that so. I, so I, while I think it's unfortunate, I do not share the same views and fears as my other colleagues. That's it. I don't. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kojo. So we've had a slight change in the program because uh, so Dr. Ravi Dev, who was supposed to be the discussant, could not be with us and called last minute, no fault of his, because he said he had to attend the swearing in ceremony of Dr. Irfan Ali as the new president of Guyana. And so uh, at the last minute, I asked um, one of the directors of this program, who is Dr. Betoram Ramharak, to fill in for uh, Ravi Dev. So Dr. Ramharak is an adjunct, adjunct professor of political science at a university in the States. And he is a prolific writer, author. He has just published his book, um, a biography of John Bahadur Singh. And then COVID came into being and he didn't have an actual launch. So we probably have to do a virtual launch. And he's always reading and writing and so on. A guy and he's living in the United States for maybe about 30 years or so. So uh, Dr. Beturam, coming from Guyana and so on, and coming from the United States is going to give us a, a, a synopsis his take and analysis of all that has been said before. Over to you, Dr. Bitharam, for speak for seven minutes. 
Uh, good evening. Can you can you folks hear me? Yes. Yes. Very well. All right. So um, Ravi Dev's, uh, you know, he has big feet. So I know because he has big big shoes. So I'll try my best to fill in for him. Um, so a couple of things first. Um, if he was here, I know he would give you a, a little summary of what's happening in Guyana. But I think, as most of you are aware, all of you, uh, I'm hoping, uh, would have known that today Mohammed Irfan Ali, um, as my Muslim brothers would say, Mubarak Ho. Um, he was sworn in as the ninth president um, of the Republic of Guyana, the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Uh, and this came after a very long struggle, um, you know, in, in a situation where we had those who control the reins of power were unwilling, um, unwilling in large bold letters uh, to, to recognize that they have lost the election and very unwilling to also hand over power. So that saga uh, came to an end uh, today uh, with the swearing in uh, of uh, Irfan Ali. Um, so, uh, so I would say that his main task right now is to bring the nation together. And again, as my Muslim brothers would say, inshallah, we wish him all the best. Um, so Guyana is now back on, uh, you know, on its path um, to strengthen that democratic process uh, that we've had. As, as you may recall, in 2015, uh, the PVP lost the election. We had a transition, a new government took, took power uh, 2020. We had a new government, we had a, another transition. Hopefully this is going to continue to be a very smooth uh, transition uh, and Irfan Ali will be given a chance to do, you know, what uh, the PPP has said that they would do in their uh, manifesto. Um, so, so that's the situation in Guyana. Um, and I know in Trinidad, you have your election coming up um, on, on the 10th, which will be a Monday. Um, we will meet here again um, on the Sunday before that day. So um, just a couple of things, uh, and I do want to kind of briefly, um, you know, just to share my, my opinion and what I'm hearing here. Uh, when we talk about outside observers, right, or election observers, it is important um, I believe uh, to have uh, observers for a number of reasons that were, you know, pointed out um, earlier. I, I think Ralph did a pretty good job of explaining, you know, why it's essential in Trinidad um, to have observers. Um, he, he did mention the, the notion that the election may be very close, and that's a potential um, also for a situation where you can have some kind of uh, minor fiddling. Uh, you know, within the process. I know in Trinidad, you've had some issues with um, the voting machines, and there were reasons why you have now resorted back to the uh, paper ballot. Um, I, I, I believe Ralph also mentioned the whole notion of, you know, this uh, potential for ethnic conflict. Uh, obviously, it's not to the extent where it is in Guyana. Um, uh, Indira mentioned the fact that as an observer, she talked about the conditions under which, you know, um, observers are uh, invited, um, and, and, and more importantly, she talked about uh, the role that observers uh, play in an election. Now, again, given given uh, the fact that we've had such a long, uh, you know, standoff in Guyana, we've got 153 days uh, since the election was held uh, in Guyana. The role of observers were extremely, extremely crucial. Uh, to what we've seen today with the swearing in. You know, we've had the ABC countries, we've had CARICOM playing a role at the Commonwealth, or OAS, EU, and of course we've had, you know, local observers in Guyana. And I do believe, and I think many people will agree that if not for these observers in Guyana, we would not have seen, um, you know, this declaration of the results, we would not have seen the fact that the U.S. was willing to impose political um, and personal sanctions on those perpetrators of uh, the electoral fraud in Guyana. So I think the, elect, the election observers are very, very crucial. Um, and I think they do play a role. Now, there were two basic reasons why, um, you know, folks in Guyana um, had rejected uh, observers. One, they were making the argument that Guyana is an independent country. And of course, you know, uh, we can handle our own local affairs. That being said, Guyana has had a history of electoral rigging. We've got the PNC in there for 28 years, right? Um, and what happened in 1992, it was electoral observers, primarily uh, President Carter of the Carter Center, who came to Guyana 
1991 and oversaw the process, not just the actual observation um, on the day of the election in 1992, but he oversaw the electoral process from looking at the registration process and the laws that were passed and so on. And even up to the day, um, when the PNC lost the election in 1992, uh, President Desmond Hoyt refused, he absolutely refused um, to hand over power. Um, uh, you had people like uh, Mr. Hamilton Green who advised him not to do that. You know, there were protests um, uh, in front and around um, GCOM, uh, which is the organization uh, that is responsible for conducting the election. But it took a call, it took a, a private call from Carter to President Bush, who made a call to President um, Hoyt, says, look, you've lost the election. You gotta make sure there's a peaceful transition and let's move on. So, so my point here is that when you look at the situation in Guyana and other countries in the Caribbean, electoral observers are very crucial. And I think the other reasons why, the other reason, and this is also important, why people um, were saying that we should not have observers in Guyana is the fact that you're, they're saying, look, you know, we are, we are an independent country, so therefore, if you're independent, you know, we do not need outsiders. We do, do not need the foreign uh, observers. We do not need the foreign colonials, those white folks to come back and tell us how to do our business. But it, it was a dire situation in Guyana. So what, my point here is that, um, and this is where I divert from uh, Professor uh, Selwyn um, to a certain extent. What I'm saying is, Observers are crucial to the democratic process. And if you don't care about inviting, you know, uh, the white folks or the former colonials uh, to observe uh, elections in Trinidad, um, then we can have local observers uh, because uh, the, the, the issues that were pointed out before um, by, by Ralph is that you have the mistrust you do have a situation of an ethnic division. Again, I, I'm not trying to blow this out of proportion, but you do have a situation where the electoral uh, race can be very close. And to me, that is a potential for corruption of the electoral process. So what I'm saying is, and again, I, I'm gonna summarize and I'm gonna end here, is electoral observers are crucial. They do play an important role because they can be part of of the democratic process, given the situation we've had in Guyana, where it was the observer, if it was not for these observers, you would have a situation in Guyana where you would still have a stalemate, and you will have a situation that will continue, uh, where that electoral fraud would have continued to, to uh, propel um, the incrementation towards a dictatorial rule in Guyana. Um, so, so, so I think they are crucial, and I think it's unfortunate. And I would end by saying this. It was uh, Prime Minister Rowley who actually went to Guyana and he made a comment, um, you know, looking at the situation there, he made the comment that this process in Guyana is not going to end well. So, so that means, that, um, you know, Prime Minister Rowley understood. He understood very well the need uh, for electoral observers because he met with them and he was there and he saw the impasse. So my final point to this is that we do need electoral observer, observers and they ought to play a meaning role. And if we don't like the outsiders uh, from the European countries, well, we have CARICOM, we have the Commonwealth. And I think they can play a major role in, in the electoral process in many of these Caribbean countries in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ramharak. Um, you did very well, excellent. And I call last minute to substitute for Mr. Ravi Dave. So the floor is now open for questions, comments, and contributions. They must be short. Now, although we don't have our usual 80 and so participants, we still would like to hear from everybody to, um, who would like to make a contribution. It should be no longer than two or three minutes, you shouldn't be really be giving a speech. Now, you can also participate by uh, writing in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. Please identify yourself by name and your country. We'd like to uh, identify everyone by name for recording purposes and for a dem de demo uh, dem demographic survey that we are doing. If your name does not appear on, the, on your profile on the screen, please click the three dots in the blue box at the top right of your picture and you can type your name. This meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded later on YouTube for posterity after it has been edited. 
Only those who are speaking should unmute their mic. So um, if you need to speak, just unmute and proceed. But no speeches, please. Yes, unmute your mic and go ahead. You, I, you don't need to catch my attention. Basan, unmute, unmute. Basan, unmute. Yes, good, good evening. Oh, Cummings, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. Uh, Stephen Cummings here, a senior broadcast journalist, uh, communications uh, specialist. I'm attached to one of the local radio stations here as well in Trinidad. Um, very interesting. Now, um, uh, you know, a question is being raised as to whether we can trust the Elections and Boundaries Commission. Now, I believe if we cannot trust and have confidence in public and independent institutions, then as a country, we are in a bad place. Not only that we may very well be at failed state status. You know, um, the office of the DPP, the judiciary, the police service uh, are all independent public institutions. Now, if you ask who are there to guard the guards, well, then that's another question. But in any event, um, you have the, the court of public opinion and the public will then adjudicate. Uh, and, and that's why elections are so important. Now, I think what you need in Trinidad and Tobago is uh, the need for greater levels of civil, political, electoral, and voter education, especially in a democracy and the frequency with which elections are held in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, it could very well be that uh, the reason we could uh, or we continue to have levels of distrust in our system and a large number of the population not voting, for example, as we talk about voter apathy, could be due to that very same issue of a lack of voter education. Now, I believe that the time has come for greater, uh, as I said, political, electoral and voter um, education. And to say that we, we need observers, um, you know, to ensure that we behave as a people tells me that our gaining of independence, 1962, post onwards, means we have not matured as a people. So that's my contribution. Thank you, Cummings. Um, yes, uh, um, it's, yes, go ahead. Yes, Hello. speak up, speak up. Hi, hear me? Yes. Vasant, Vasant okay. you don't need to catch my attention. Just unmute your phone and speak. Go ahead, uh, uh, yes. Kasraj. Uh, okay, thank you. I'm Trinidadian, Kasraj is the name. Are you hearing me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, first of all, let me say that um, Observers are not there only to look for flaws or fraud, but they're also there to validate and authenticate an election. So that's a good thing for any government. But what I want to say today, and probably Dr. Kojo, I hope, or Professor Kojo, I hope he's listening. In the last election, Trinidad had an electorate of 1,051,147 electors. That's just Trinidad, 39 seats. So the average would have been 26,952. Therefore, the, the, the band uh, uh, for uh, any constituency in Trinidad would vary from 29,647 as an upper limit and 24,257 vote electors as a, as a lower limit. Now we had Port of Spain North, St. Anne's West, the Honorable Stuart Young's constituency, that seat, he got, he won by 24,123 votes. As I said, the lower limit should have been 24,257. So it was lower than the required amount. Not only that, Port of Spain South had 23,778 votes uh, cast. No, 23,778 electors. And um, again, the minimum should have been 24,257. But and strange enough, Sandy Grandi, Toko, Toko Sandy Grandi, had 30,149. And the upper limit should have been 29,647. So I don't know if that is a mistrust in the, in the, in the EBC, but you know, that definitely something was wrong there. Probably those three seats should have been null and void. Um, that would have been a different result. So I would like to know, I'd like to hear the commentators on that. Thank you. 
Right. Let's hear um, a comment from any of the presenters, and then we'll go to Vasan. I want to. Was to uh, not, uh, yeah. Can you put me on? I'm not. I'm yes. Not, yes. Yes. You. I'm not, yes. Are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. Go ahead. Uh, the first thing is that I, I, I didn't know you we were going to talk about Guyana. I did not know that Guyana's uh, political history is the same as Trinidad's. If you go back to 1953 and go back to Chetty Jagan and the breaking up of Chetty Jagan and then these voters, these absentee voters, Guyana's history is quite different from ours. And I don't think that is the correct analogy. That's point one. Point two, you go back to the voting machines of 19, what I think, 61 or 62, it was abruptly removed by William. He said, if you, don't take, if you don't like it, we'll take it out. Number three, I think we all began by saying that we trust and we believe, I let me speak for myself, that the EBC has done a fairly good job over the years. I mean, the same pin and see when NAR came into power, they swept them to the three to three. And the, 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 the parties have been going backward and forward, which suggests to me that this, this, the, the, the the, the system has been fairly, I mean, the question of an hour, I was there when this hour thing and because people couldn't vote, all right. But that should not in any way, it seems to me, negate the entire process. And I think Mr. Cummins' position is where I go back to, and that's why I start by the ethnic, mis it depends on where you're coming from, the ethnic mistrust, the non-belief in our own possibilities. We see it in terms of the Caribbean Court of Justice. We see it in terms of going up to England in 1962. There is vast distrust. And the position that we must always have somebody from the outside, the last speaker who, uh, in fact, uh, sort of brought things to a close and sort of, I'm asking one, are there voter uh, observers in the United States who are foreign? Are there foreign observers in England or the UK are there foreign voters in France? And if we are suggesting, as I am suggesting, I think, I, and, and I'm saying it's unfortunate we don't have it, but I think our history proves something quite different. We've, been, we've done a very good job in terms of just seeing the parties, uh, who comes into power, PDP, whatever, whatever, people come into power and move out of. I have enormous respect, and I agree with Mr. Cummins, as it seems to be, it would be an ethnic thing or a party thing. I have tremendous respect. I think they have done, a, now the question of electoral boundaries and all that stuff, we have the same thing in terms of voter suppression in this country. America have the whole, it's the same thing. Uh, but I'm just, I think that it's unfortunate. I think if you'd ask me, should we have had observers or not? I would say yes, I think that's preferable. But if we don't have observers, I don't think that's sufficient to invalidate the process and have mistrust in the process. And as for Ralph, he talks about all, I mean, there's all kinds of question of corruption. I don't know what it had to do with the question of observers and non-observers. He says there's been enormous corruption. Well, somebody can make the same point for the UNC. It doesn't help us that there will be corruption and there has been corruption. But to outlay a story where there's only corruption and therefore there is mistrust, not by the opinion, but by the EBC, who in fact is supposed to be an independent organization, I seem is a bit, I think is a bit off the mark. Okay, Vasant I have wants faith. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vasant had his hand up. Unmute your mic, sir. And uh, Vasant. Okay. We're not hearing him. Not hearing him. We're not hearing him. All right, somebody else. Uh, yes. Um, yes, yes, he's here now. Yes, uh, Dr. Mahavia. Okay, uh, okay. Bassan wanted to talk a long time ago. So go ahead, be short, please. I'm not seeing him. Okay. Yeah, Vasan, go ahead. Okay. Speak up. The first thing I want to say, okay, Caricom is not foreigner. I'm not okay. hearing him. Can you hear me? No, I'm not hearing you, Vasan. Okay. Caricom is not foreigner. And I believe if we sign on on the... Huh? Not hearing you. Hello? All right, Hello? you have to co come Can back you to you. Now? Yeah, okay, Can go ahead. Last try, go ahead. Oh, God. Okay, he was saying something about uh, CARICOM. We don't consider them as foreigners. Okay, I think uh, Professor Gonzalez wanted to say something. Yes, uh, Dr. Mahabir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, um, yeah. I, 
I am wondering whether to, um, we are really examining the issue from in terms of what is actually happening. In the sense that nobody in this country is against foreign observers. I think I, from hearing uh, Professor Kojo, he's not against foreign observers. The problem is that in these difficult times of COVID and, and um, closure of borders and so forth, um, is it possible to have these observers? Now, the Prime Minister declared an election about four weeks ago, within the time limit that he had, and I guess every politician has the right to choose the time he's going to do that because it's strategically you want to get that advantage. So we were left with about um, five weeks within which to get these observers. Within the first week, the opposition leader said that she wanted to have observers, and the prime minister immediately said yes. And he, he informed the CARICOM secretariat and the, and the Commonwealth secretariat. Now he came back to us and said that he was informed, he has been informed by these two secretariats that they cannot supply us with observers. He would like to see observers. He was even saying that he would, he's still urging the CARICOM secretariat to send observers, and maybe that may, may still be possible. So we're still waiting to see. He said clearly that the Commonwealth Secretariat indicated that they could not afford to send observers. So what, what, I'm, what I'm hearing doesn't seem to correspond to that, to that discussion. You know, we're going over uh, something about the EBC. The EBC has a, a splendid track record in this country. Nobody doubts that. We have seen all sorts of governments come and go here. Three elections in three years, um, elections that are tied, different changes over time. So that I'm not sure really to what extent we're really dealing with the issues of hand. It's not a question of mistrust of the EBC. EBC. None of, we don't have any mistrust in the EBC here. The question is, could the observers come on time? And as I said, nobody, I don't, everybody's in favor of the observers if it is possible for them to come. But we are dealing with difficult um, conditions, difficult times, and I think to some extent we have to take that into the discussion. And I haven't heard any concession made to that uh, you know, from, from, from all that I've heard. Thank you. Right. I see Dr. Rampasad has her hand up, so um, she wants to make a comment, and then we'll go to somebody in the audience. Indira, unmute. That's okay. She's I'm here. Yet. I'm here. Yes. Sorry. Uh -huh. um, yes. So the previous speaker, who was a bit garbled, and we couldn't recognize what he was saying. I recognize what he was saying. I don't think that's he was fair. Saying I that recognized he was... what he was saying. That's not fair. Yeah, so no, but I had the same point, you see, that's what I was going to say, that um, CARICOM is not, is not foreign as in colonial foreign, nor the OAS, because the majority of states in the OAS are Latin American states. So I don't know if we want to bring in these vestiges of colonialism and to, 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 to say that we can't handle our affairs and we are still, to, you know, holding on to colonialism by bringing in foreign um, observers. Um, Dr. Gonzalez uh, did, did say he doesn't have a problem with that. Um, the issue with, I think, the, the issue that he raised about Dr. Rowley attempting to get the observers, but there were, if, there were concerns with the COVID issue. Um, I think the concern on the opposition side is that they have no proof that this was actually said, what was said, because they asked, I think they asked for the correspondence from the Commonwealth Office, which they didn't get. Um, that, that's my understanding of that situation. So I'm not sure we have full information on that from either side. And um, that is one of the concerns, that is one of the concerns, that is one of the reasons for the, uh, for the concerns. Um, now the, the CARICOM observer mission, they, all the missions do a report after. They do a report and I would invite people to go online. Some of these reports are online. Um, some of them are quite positive as to how the elections were conducted in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, some of them um, highlight concerns, the serious concerns. I, I mentioned the power outages, that's where I got it from the report. Um, they talk about potential for thuggery, violence, hostile acts, intimidation in marginal constituencies like Samoa Barataria. They talk about voter pattern, the use of cell phones to take 
photographs of cash ballots as proof of payment for corrupt persons who bribe votes. So I think that these issues, these things that would have come to their attention, the reporters' attention, would have come to the public's attention. And there's a video circulating. Um, I think last night I saw it of someone being really um, assaulted, seriously assaulted in a car. Um, all I could see is the person doing the assault was um, wearing a red jersey, but I don't know who was in the car and I don't know what the assault was about. But I think um, CNC3 carried the news tonight. I really don't have the full information about the story. But what I'm saying is that the observers, they do a lot of research and they, they, do, um, they do seek information. I was actually interviewed, I believe, in 2015 about the election because they try to get a feel of what is going on. And um, while I, I agree for the most part, and we're much better than Guyana, for the most part, we have had um, free and fair elections. I think there are issues that have punctuated that over time uh, in, over different elections. These are highlighted in the reports. These are the concerns of the electorate. And uh, therefore, these serve not to instill the level of confidence that we would want in the electoral process. So. Um, uh, Professor Kojo, I take your point. Um, I understand why you would say that because we haven't had any, we haven't had what has erupted in Guyana and certainly not what has erupted in Guyana this year. But we have to understand given the similarities in the ethnic compositions the history, of these two different. countries, the history, the, the yeah, the history. history is different. Just we, because we agree. they have the same population we, we, in terms of ethnicity doesn't mean the issues are the same. But it doesn't mean that it can never happen either. I'm not I'm suggesting that at all. You've given me just one or two examples. Tell me any election in the world where there have not been some kind of uh, intimidation or some problems. What I think we should do, which I think is a fair way to proceed, is simply suggest, given the general situation, all things being equal, People last week and two weeks ago, two days ago, the piano get up and dance up with UNC and all kind of dancing. The question is, you cannot take the exception and say that's the rule. I think all things being equal, our track record as a country has been one of free and fair elections, and which, as the gentleman said before, and Mr. Cummins says before. While it's interesting, while we should, as I said, we should have, if it's, uh, you're quite right, if, we ha if, if there should be observers, then okay, if we could get them, let us get them. But I don't think that that should throw a poll over the outcome of the elections. And I think the gentleman said, we've seen the transition of governments, the, one of the major achievements of Trent Tobago, forget Guyana. People lose, they go home. I've never seen any fights, somebody trying to hold on whatever. NAR win, people go home. PNM win, people go home. PPP win, people go home. We have had a, 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 a very exemplary history. And while there may be small incidents that somebody, one person with a red shirt and so on, those are not suf a sufficient condition to say, for example, the elections are not free and fair. And I would say to you that in point of fact, that we have conducted ourselves, and I said, I think that, that the election results, there would be some, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but perfection does not exist in this world. But I think we've done a very good job. Like I said, if it is that there could be observers, let there be observers. But I would not preempt the elections and say, whoever wins is because of election irregularities. Right. It's not in the history. Uh -huh. history. And of course, yeah. again, yeah. you're right, the one thing, Andrea, if it does, if it did happen, we'd have had the experience and the documentation mm. by the observers. But my initial, I think that's what we're talking about, the absence of these observers. And I'm saying, sticking with the question, that the absence of these observers is unfortunate. I would prefer to have them. But okay. they're not being there, doesn't daunt me terribly. Yes, point, point taken, point taken, and you have made the point. Um, we have someone from the audience again, I see. Ram. Yeah. Yes. yes, go ahead, sir. Yeah. Ram Jagisa in Toronto. Um, on the issue of um, foreign observers uh, coming in possibly to detect some kind of, um, you know, interference with the election process by the ruling party, that is the PNM, wouldn't it be reasonable to say that the PNM doesn't have much to fear from this election? 
In the last election, they pulled in 378,000 voters. The PNM has a wonderful election machinery. Nobody doubts that. Um, on the three previous occasions when the PNM lost elections, in 86, when they were wiped out, in 95, when Pandey beat them, in 2010, when they were beaten by, um, you, know, you, know, you, you know, by Kamala, didn't the PNM bounce back even harder than before? So that they have a wonderful record of bouncing back from defeat. So I, you know, I'm asking, is it, isn't it fair to think that they don't have really anything to worry about this election? And Who don't have anything to worry about? PNM. I don't think the PNM has anything to worry about with this election, okay. uh, okay. which would mean that uh, we should bring observe, foreign observers and so on to come and check if they're doing wrong things. Because purely on a free and fair basis, I think the PNM has the base support. Their core support is untouched. And they, they have a record of bringing out a lot of people, as I said, 378 thousand in the last election so why should we feel that they wouldn't have a problem bringing out the same amount again and walking away with the election this time okay so we have another question from somebody new in the audience uh, yes sir yeah dr mabia uh, yeah, could yeah. i just yes could yeah. i just add that uh, in addition yeah. to the three instances where the pnm lost could i just mention that there was two thousand as well where the pnm lost to mr pandey yeah. And then you had two successive elections, which one was a tie, and they had to go back again. And in all those three elections, which took place, I believe, within about two years, nobody queried what the EB EBC did. So that I have difficulty in trying to understand why is it that we, we are questioning the EBC? Why is it that we feel that you know there's there's, need, there's that mistrust? Uh, because I do I do not see it. I do not really uh, observe any kind of basic mistrust of the EBC in this, in this country. I, I think that certainly we would like to have uh, foreign observers, but in these circumstances, it may be difficult. And if we accept that, we, we try and see how we could work around it. But we are not starting from the premise that we need observers because we mistrust the system. I think we have had a wonderful yeah. system that has that worked, quite unlike Guyana. And I've looked at the Guyana um, Electoral um, Commission, and I can see the difficulty they're having. They do not have really probably independent people that would stand up against the politicians as we have had here in the EBC. The EBC here has never been challenged, except in the last election that someone, that the opposition took the EBC to court on the question of the rain falling for one hour, which was, which was really superfluous, which was really trivial, trivial as, the court, as the court mentioned. So I really do not see that we have a serious problem in this country with respect to the EBC. And if we can get the observers on time, sure, we would have them. If they don't come well, we'll proceed and go ahead. So Thank I really you. don't see what the difficulty is about. Thank you. Somebody new from the audience? Um, so I would uh, like to add Yes, Roger. Dr. Hussein. Yeah. Um, Let me see Roger's so face. I, I want think... Um, Roger so Hussein. I want to see your face. <laughs> go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen uh, Prof. Kodjo in about 10 years. Uh, my view is that I wonder, so certainly I see no harm from, from, from my point of view as an economist in having um, observers. They could be foreign, they could be members of the embassy or whatnot. And I think, um, I think if it is someone who raises the concern of observers, that the, that the safest thing to do it is to satisfy them in terms of bringing these observers that, I, as I say, if they come from the chambers, the TTME, the, the, the local um, people from the embassies here, the, the, the foreign people in the embassies here, and meet criteria in terms of satisfying those who requested it. The, the reason I say that is, are there any little peculiarities we, we may overlook in terms of the number of people in the room? in terms of specifics that COVID-19 protocol and COVID-19 social distancing may bring in terms of, of the, the, the process by which the ballot uh, boxes are, are, are actually counted. So I, I don't know, but, but that is definitely something that is different to all the elections we had in the past. So it may add some degree of uncertainty in the mind of some people and therefore just to appease 
and to continue in the same vein of free and fair elections that we have had in the past. So be it, just, just let the process uh, work itself in the context of the request so that this pandemic is, 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 does not create any little abnormality or deviation to, to tarnish our good record of free and fair uh, elections. That, that's my little contribution. Thank you. I think Dul Hanuman had, uh, was going to say something. Is it Hanuman? Okay. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Uh, I'm yeah. Like, go ahead. I'm like Indira. I like Indira Rampasad. I'm wondering what is the role of the HDC because I have noticed during this five years, Rowley in power, how. So your Okay. where uh, more than 150 apartments were given out. And the recipient were mainly, at least people looking like PNM supporters. Black people. So that, that, Black that people. ACC is, uh, ACC is works to undermine the democracy. But, you know, this country historically has been stacked with people who favor the PNM, all right? I, I would like to get some comments on that. Yes, Dr. Apasad. Well, I don't have the statistics about the distribution, but these are allegations that have been made over the years, and these contribute to the uh, concerns and, you know, for the, for the, 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 the need for observers, uh, you know, that these things will go down in a report at any rate. There were also concerns with the movement of some polling divisions. And while many of them were in safe seats, uh, the biggest concern was uh, two polling divisions in San Fernando West being moved from San Fernando East for this election. But um, just to respond to Dr. Gonzalez on election petition, Dr. Gonzalez, one of the reasons why people are more uncomfortable this election, because the last election, and I'm saying it's still in the minds of the people, the judge had ruled, and I will read what the judge had said, Accordingly, it is in my view, and I hold that the extension of the poll on 7 September was illegal, and election officers who failed to close the polls at 6 p.m. acted in breach of Section 71 of the election rules. These are the judge's words. These are not mine. Now, when you hear judgment coming out of that, but yet they claim the petition was null and void, it makes people uncomfortable. It makes people extremely uncomfortable. And this, 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 uh, while you might say it was, you know, superfluous, the one hour, um, you know, some may say yes, the inclement weather merited it. This is coming from the mouth of the judge and um, have made people uncomfortable in 2015. And it remains in the minds of some people in 2020. Thank you. Good. So we have just about uh, 10 minutes again, and we will, as the discussant, we'll give Dr. Yep. Ramharat the final word, but somebody new has to say something or? Yes, um, or I was yeah. going to say something, um, maybe before the program. Is, yes, um, be, just be short because you had an opportunity earlier. Yes, I know. Um, again, I'll be very short. Um, you know, I want to go back to this question of uh, voter, you know, education. I think the problems that we're having as a people is that we uh, we are deficient in terms of um, understanding you know the process uh, especially you know in in the, this um in, in this part of the world you know not just trinidad and tobago but throughout the caribbean uh, we having when we're talking about the independence of um institutions such as the Elections and Boundaries Commission, should we trust them, should we not trust them? Uh, we have a whole lot of independent institutions throughout the, the, the region. And I'm saying that, uh, that if we can't trust these institutions, well then who can we trust? Um, you know, we know about, um, we have emerged uh, uh, out of the independence era and, and the very fact that we came out of that era under the British rule was that, um, you know, we, we, we are supposed to be at a stage where um, we are supposed to show that kind of uh, maturity, political maturity and, and, and otherwise. So, Dr. Uh, Mr. Cummings, um, about integrity and independence of these institutions, they are not really independent. I have personally made complaints and I know others too who I can call to the Equal Opportunity Commission, to the Ombudsman, to the Integrity Commission, and it has gone to naught. They have not been satisfied. Sometimes you don't even get an acknowledgement. 
There are cases, mm. there are complaints pending for years be before the uh, Equal Opportunities Commission. So um, I don't buy that, that claim that these are independent um, institutions. They, 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 I mean, that's not a, that's, that's a, there are cases and murder cases that take 10 years. It doesn't mean that they're not independent. It I simply means that they're not efficient. <laughs> That is the point. Not that they're independent. They're not efficient. But I, I don't accept the fact again. I, they're not independent. I have. I can I lay I claims to you. And they're not independent. That. That's why I st started by saying it depends on one's ethnic affiliations and one's political affiliations. I do not think. I think that a lot of these institutions are, in fact, they are inefficient. They don't have the kinds of resources that make them. Uh, efficient and so on, or do they respond and so on? But I don't. I, I think for the large part, these institutions try their best. One more thing, Mr. Stevens. I don't know that the people are deficient. I don't know what you mean by people are deficient. I think people do the best they can in any situation. The ba the basic premise of any democracy is that people, ordinary people, understand what their needs and desires are, and that's why they exercise. The franchise, we've gotten a long way from the divine rights of kings. People understand what they've done. And I would reiterate, I think that the Elections and Boundaries Committee, and if you go back, let's go back from, say, when, from 1986, as the gentleman tried to point out. And you see the amount of elections we have had and the transference of power to all these different groups tells you something about the fundamental fairness and equity of these, these places. They're not always, they're not always uh, as I said, perfect. There's no perfect union. Even in great United States with, with this, these chads in Florida, they had their problems too. It didn't mean they weren't independent. People make the mistakes and so on. But I like us to see what I, my dear desire would be, we try to be much more acceptable of our own institutions. Part of our problem is there's a general fear on behalf of of the society where we do not trust one another. And we're not gonna go any place if we keep on distrusting one another and saying, listen, yes, there are shortcomings, but we have to say, Kuma, I think you're gonna do the right thing. Roger, you're gonna do the right thing. And we must all strive towards that. Now, where there must be say trust and verify, that's fine. If you have the trust, yes, and verify, that's fine. But I think we've done a pretty good job in Trinidad Tobacco. Okay, no, so we have five, about five minutes again, uh, and before we turn over for the final closing from the uh, Ram Harad. So, somebody is saying something new? Mike Dr. Prasad, Maharaj, yes. may I yes. ask a question? What is the, what is the reason why um, the Prime Minister of Trinidad is objecting to observers, local and foreign? What is his reason for objecting? Thank you. Well, maybe the panelists can answer that. But somebody okay. said it. I don't know who said it in terms well, of... I, <laughs> the Prime Minister... Yes, um, Dr. Mahavia? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the Prime Minister has never objected to foreign observers. What he said, he asked these institutions, the Commonwealth Secretariat and the CARICOM Secretariat, to send observers, and they replied to him that they, they couldn't send um, observers under the circumstances. And he was still working with the CARICOM Secretariat to see if he can get still get some observers to come before the election is held uh, the following week. So the Prime Minister is not against observers. But it's, but, a, fair, it's but a fair he, point I think that Indriana, Indriana has raised in terms of, well, if you say there's a letter, why don't you show us the letter? Well, well, so, well certainly we can, we can raise that, that but, but a, the fact that's that- a valid, I, That's a valid position. But I wouldn't see why the Prime Minister would say something like that when you the don't know. Secretary you do not, can you, always can always deny you, it. You, you would go outside your life and, and Russ, the Prime Secretary Russ, could always Russ, say that. Russ, it, it, it wouldn't be the first time, Dr. Gonzalez. <laughs> I mean, it wouldn't be the I mean, first ask, time. And verify. I mean, he would he would be putting himself out on a limb to go and do something like that. Um, why would he do that? Okay, can we have and a fi any, any, final question or comment? Yeah, final uh, question yeah. or comment from the audience, from somebody new. Come on. Uh, yes. I, 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 yes, yes, yes. Dennis, nice to have you. Man. Oh, boy, Dennis, I see another one wanted to talk like discriminating against you, boy, against <laughs> yeah, your head. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. I, 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 my, the problem I am having is that um, the two, the two schools, um, Selwyn, Selwyn position that we could do, we could do it without the, the, advi the um, advisors or the overseer and 
Dr. Rampasad position that because, and Ralph position that we can't trust the, 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 the directorate, so we can't do it without the observers. The problem is not that. The problem is let us go through how the EBC functions and see what we could do with, with the terms of the supervision of the election to write off the thing. The thing that we're saying wrong, and the thing, we, if you bring observers, the things that, the problems they have with the, 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 the election, if you bring observer or you don't bring observer, we could still have them problem because EBC supervision within EBC in terms of the, um, in terms of, of how the election run, observers can't fix that. So that Mr. Cummins, have the right thing. We have to get an education thing. As a matter of fact, we better educate the very politician so that we can get the EBC running or we, go, we could observe the EBC. We don't want people to come and tell we not. Mm -hmm. The EBC problem is how it, it's not functioning right. It has nothing to do with if people have peep, we go do wrong. That has no sense. We don't want to observe We want we business fixed. That's why it does that's get institution to get right. Not by bringing people to see if you're doing the institution right, by fixing your institution. Hmm. Understand? Okay. So one <laughs> fi final, final, uh, one <laughs> from somebody new. One final question or comment. Somebody who hasn't spoken before. And uh, if there is nobody, then Mr. Cummings, uh, be short, and then we will ask Dr. Bitaram to close the the the, the meeting. Yes, that's my very point, um, the last speaker. If we are not educated and we, if we don't understand the process and how the process is, is supposed to work, uh, there's no way that we can say, well, um, you know, this institution is, is being this way or that way. Um, and, and education has always been that, uh, that, that, that issue where um, we know that, you know, if, if, if we lack the knowledge, we're going to be making errors all the time over and over again. So I think that what we need to do is to embark on some kind of uh, massive education program. When we talk about elections, um, when we talk about uh, the role and function of the EBC, how it's supposed to work in a democratic in institution, um, you know, so I think that is our problem. You know, we're squabbling over this thing about, um, you know, whether the EBC is, um, you know, wh whether they, they and, and even the question of observers, whether we, sh we should have them or not. I think once we are fully educated people, uh, we'll be able to solve a major part of our problems. So education this is, does not necessarily bring maturity and objectivity. Uh, Dr. Betaram, can you um, close the program by giving your final words? Yeah, your mic, your mic. Yeah. Uh, so my final words would be brief, right? Um, so um, this is an interesting discussion. Um, uh, now, we have to separate, I think, you know, what is uh, from what ought to be. And I know um, as Selwyn keeps saying that, you know, um, accusations may be uh, based on, you know, one's perspective or where you're coming from. But, but if that is really true, um, and given what the, the other speakers have said about some irregularities, whether they are minor or major, right? And it seems like they are minor because Trinidad does have a long tradition, unlike Guyana, uh, and, and incidentally, I did bring in Guyana because I know, um, as the previous discussant, you'd always want to have like a sort of a summary of what's going on in Guyana. So be be that as it may, what I'm saying is, if there are issues that people uh, may be looking at things from their own perspective and they have seen some minor irregularities in the past it doesn't necessarily mean that everything will be okay because ultimately what you're trying to do with an election is you're trying to instill confidence, right? The election has to be free and fair. And I think that confidence has to come from the fact that it is a process that everyone, regardless of which perspective you're coming from, can agree that this process has been free and fair and the outcome is legit. And I think that's the goal. Now, and I know people always talk about the United States and so on, but the fact remains that we in the Caribbean 
and I think Trinidad to a certain extent are also, you know, we're new nations and this is a process uh, that's going to take some time. I think the education process will take some time. I think the fact that we have uh, an electoral, you know, boundary commission, you know, that's going to take some time to kind of create that kind of trust in everyone across the spectrum. And I think as we continue to create strong institutions, these issues of trust will hopefully be eliminated. But I think the fact that some of the speakers here brought it up, that there are some, some concerns, I, I, it's not far-fetched to see a situation where um, observers can play a key role. And again, um, I'm not saying that Trinidad is, is in such a state where it is ultimately and absolutely necessary. I think you've done a pretty good job at promoting an institutionalized uh, form of democracy where in fact, people you know who have lost going home and say, hey, this thing is over. We're going to prepare for the next uh, election in five years from now. But I think the fact that some of the discussion that has raised and some of the uh, participants have raised issues of, you know, uh, uh, minor concerns. And I think uh, that alone uh, creates an atmosphere where if it was possible, I understand it may not have been possible at this time around, uh, given uh, COVID and, and so on. If it's possible, I do believe that observers uh, can in fact play a role in certifying that an electoral process had been free and fair and the outcome is legitimate. And again, I, I, I'm basing that uh, on the fact that given the experience with other Caribbean countries, uh, primarily in Guyana. Thank you very much. And I, in closing, I want to um, emphasize the point made by Dr. Rampasa that the judge in the case that went before the court in the last election, the judge had ruled that the EBC was wrong. It was illegal to extend the voting hours. So this brings us to the end of our public meeting. Thank you all for taking the time to participate. Thanks especially to the presenters. Thanks to the ICDN team behind me. I am just the face of, the, of that team. The team is directed by Mr. Dul Hanuman who uh, spoke this, uh, this evening. And the other collaborators are Dr. Vishnu Bishram and Dr. Betaram Ramharak, who we are here seeing for the first time. And uh, you are free to write for the paper. This is a project of the paper, Indo-Caribbean Diaspora News. Send us your letters, send us your articles and so on. And we hold this meeting every Sunday night at 7.30, Trinidad Atlantic time, on a variety of topics. If you don't hear for us, from us, and you want to know what topic we are uh, going to be discussed, then email us, WhatsApp us, and we will send you an update. Maybe we just overlooked um, sending you our update on what, what the new topic is going to be. Our topic for next Sunday night, that's the day before elections, that's next Sunday, is to be tentatively entitled, Who Will Win the Election in Trinidad and Tobago? how and why. And I'm sure we may ask some of these presenters here to come back and uh, have some discussions on that. Ladies and gentlemen, be safe. Enjoy the rest of the day or night, depending on, the, on your time zone, because there are people from Fiji here, I saw. And uh, goodbye, take care, and bye-bye.